Hey folks, so here are some pointers on uh, reading uh, academic articles. Um, so before we even start, I just want to show you that I've actually included um, an example of how I read and take notes um, on an academic article. Um, and so you are going to sort of see how I, you know, underline things and type in the margins. Um, to kind of remind myself of what I've read. Um, yeah, and in the very end of the piece too, uh, I have like this little summary of what, what I read, okay? So just use this. I think that there are different examples, but it's a really good idea to sort of um, have a strategy, all right, for reading academic articles. So just sort of know that that's there for you, um, but, I also kind of put together this document. I'm not going to read it at you, but I am going to click on it. It's sort of broken up into different types of uh, difficulties that people might have with both reading academic articles and then also writing their own stuff. You don't have to go through all of them, but I do want to go through at least um, the first two sections. Um, of these, the first is that you're not going to understand everything that you read. You're just not. And you could have a PhD and still not understand everything that someone wrote. And it doesn't mean that you're not cut out for this. It just means that some people are kind of obtuse when they're writing. It's not always the best writing style, to be completely honest. It's not my preference anyway. Um, also, when you're reading something and you don't understand it, don't keep on reading the same sentence over and over again because it's just going to take you so long and it's just torturous. Just read for content, uh, context. So in the words of uh, Dory from Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. Um, yeah. And then also just keep in mind that like if a piece of scholarship looks complicated and it, they will in a critical theory class. My biggest recommendation and one that I wish someone would have told me a really long time ago is to read the conclusion first, right? Don't read the, like you can read the title, let's scroll down to the bottom and read the conclusion first. Then the next thing you wanna do is like scan the document and look for the headings um, just to see, it'll give you a roadmap of what you're about to expect and then read from the beginning. It's going to save you so much heartache, okay? So just sort of keep that in mind. There's not going to be that much heartache though because you are going to be like reading these collaboratively together um, online through Google Docs, so it's not that shabby, but I did want to address those things since this is a class on literary theory and I don't think that we often talk about the actual reading of literary theory and how isolating that can be if someone doesn't talk to you about what that looks like. Um, the next thing is just like the point of academic research. This also seems really important given the class. Um, so the first is just to kind of get in the habit of mind of asking yourself how how does this theory that I'm reading influence the way that I am reading and writing the world? And then also, how does this piece of theory that I'm reading, might how, how might it help me expand who we can see as human, right? There's a reason why this is a class in the humanities, right? So there's that. But also, I just want to emphasize a couple other things. Um, the point of academic research isn't that we have to agree with every single thing that we that someone else forwards in their argument. I mean, that doesn't even happen to me, right? Even when I'm reading in my own field. The point is to find the things that you can use. And there are always things that you can use in an academic article. So I really want you to like look at academic articles for like pearls of wisdom that you find compelling. All right, that's the point of engaging in academic research, like reading other people's research. Um, related um, to that, the point of academic research isn't to like regurgitate um, what someone else has already said. And I feel like we get that drilled into us in like high school or maybe really uh, other horrible classes where it's like, oh, I have to prove that I read this piece. That's actually not what academic research is about. Um, it's really to home in on um, what you find compelling about that scholar's research and then make notes to yourself about, hey, here's how I can use this idea, right? Um, I also want to say that if Future You is doing research for like a particular topic, like maybe you are looking at, um, I don't know, how SpongeBob is really uh, talking about disability, right? 
it doesn't mean that every single article that you find has to be about SpongeBob and disability, right? Like sometimes you can find articles that are about like disability in the prison industrial complex, right? And you're like, oh, that has nothing to do with what I'm doing. That's actually not true because they might have a really cool concept in there that you can then use in your paper about SpongeBob and disability. Does that sort of make sense? So just like really keep that in mind um, that it doesn't, there doesn't have to be that one-on-one -on -one overlap, okay? Um, and sometimes like reading a little bit out of our area of expertise or our topic area ends up being the thing that enlivens our, um, our thinking. Um, and then also, this is really, really important. When you're researching, I want you to start thinking about an article, like we always think about articles, it's like, okay, like, this is an article, right? And it's got these pages, and then we're done. But actually, I think it's better to think about an article as like a collection of ideas, right? That they're just sort of parts and your job is kind of like, I don't know, roaming a salvage yard or like a reclaimed hardware store or a thrift store. And you're walking around and looking for what you can use, right? So no one's going to quiz you on exactly what the article said. The idea is to say, hey, like what spare parts can I use in this article to build something else? Okay, like the only time someone is going to quiz you on exactly what you read in an article is if you are a PhD student studying for your qualifying exams. And that is a torturous experience. So we're just going to shove that down in my psyche. But the point is, you probably, some of you might go on to grad school, some of you not, but for the most part, you don't even have to worry about that. Okay. And then also keep in mind that like 99% of the time, when you're reading other people's research, your job is to collect like ideas and concepts so that you can build something new, right? Um, or that you can maybe take a concept, right? That someone wrote in a paper about prison abolition and disability and apply that concept to SpongeBob, right? You can do that. Um, I'm sure that there's someone writing about that. Like I know I'm like, just pull that out of my ass, but I, <laughs> I bet you a dolly do a donut someone's writing about that, okay? So there's that. There are also some really good tips about how to become a more efficient researcher. Uh, there's, a, I think, a good section on, like, how to take notes that you never have to read something again. You might want to check that out. Um, and then there are just things if, like, future you is someone who is going to, like, end up going to grad school or you're doing an honors thesis, I would check out this section, okay? Um... Also, if you're someone who struggles with your writing um, in terms of just like writing academic essays, even though this class, I, I'm really kind of nipped that in the bud by making these little micro assignments, I still want you to just kind of learn some sort of tips about how to how to kind of address some things you might be struggling with. Um, if you're someone who, who gets writer's block a lot when you're writing academic papers, you know, check out this section. Again, you don't have to read that if you don't want to, but there's some solid advice in there. Um, and there's a related section if you're someone who's like dealing with like writer's block, okay? Um, there's some good strategies to kind of get you out of that. Now, um, the next uh, two sections, some of you might want to check out, but I don't want to, you know, certainly make assumptions because you're all in like a literary theory class. But I'll tell you that uh, I didn't have a literary theory class in undergrad. I took my first literary theory classes in graduate school, and there were definitely times that I read things that made me uncomfortable or that challenged me, and that initially I read them, and I'm like, what the hell is this? But the thing is, I want you to know that that experience of, of that gut reaction to something is really part of the learning process. It's actually our lizard brains being like, I don't like this new idea, right? Because it challenges something, some other narrative that we have inside of ourselves. So instead of judging yourself and being like, oh, I'm a horrible person, just be curious about that resistance. I don't, you don't have to like answer the question of like, you know, how does this new information challenge this narrative that I'm already invested in, but just sort of let that question percolate. Because eventually I would say that most of the time, if you let those ideas percolate and you entertain them, you're going to realize that that like gut reaction will eventually like that knee jerk bad reaction leads to more of like a, a slower aha moment later on where you're like, damn. And sometimes it happens like within the time that you're reading, sometimes like weeks later, sometimes years later. But the point is, 
it'll happen. And eventually, when you, especially if you're someone who is going to be doing research a lot, um, like me, I mean, I research all the time, that kind of lag between that gut check uh, and the aha moment gets shorter and shorter, right? And sometimes I don't get that at all, right? But the idea here is just don't don't judge yourself for that. It happens all the time and it's normal, right? So you are going to read some things in this class that are just going to piss you off. Sometimes it's going to piss you off because it's talking about oppression and like, yeah, let's all get pissed off about that. But like sometimes it's going to challenge you because you're like, oh shit, I never thought about that. And that kind of challenges the ways that I've been thinking about the world, right? Um, so just sort of know and know to expect that. Related to that, like, my guess is I don't need to say this, but I, I thought it would sort of put that in there. Just some notes on like the trustworthiness of like peer review, right? Like there's definitely a difference between someone who is like dedicated their entire career to like studying something and then like some rando who like uploads a YouTube video, right? I know y'all know that, right? That's why you're in this class. But just sort of keep that in mind because I think sometimes our instinct when something challenges us to be like, well, that person's entitled to their opinion and I'm entitled to mine. Well, like, yeah, that's certainly true, right? But there is a little bit of a difference from someone who's like dedicated their lives to study this and then like someone who's literally been dealing with this for like all of 15 minutes, right? So just kind of use that, use that it for what you will, right? But just, just something to sort of keep in mind, right? Um, and yeah, like, you know, keep in mind that, yeah, like, no one who's, like, public, any, the stuff that you read, it all went through peer review, and peer review is kind of like a combination of Battle Royale and the Hunger Games for nerds. It's not a fun process. Um, basically, it's sort of like, you know, all these, like, anonymous Gandalfs that read your shit, and you're like, you shall not pass, right? And they throw, they throw your article everywhere. Um, and sometimes people don't make it through peer review. Or they have to revise stuff and resubmit it, etc., etc. Sometimes it, you know, it gets rejected because it was a shitty article, right? The point is, you know, I think you can't just be like, oh, people are just making all this stuff up. Probably if it's gone through peer review, that's not the case. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes things don't go through peer review or maybe should have not made it through peer review that sometimes happens but that's rare and then when it does happen academics are like how the hell did this make it through peer review and then they're like i'm not kidding you they will like come together and like petition the editor to like take that shit off like 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 remove it from the publication because academics have no chill and i think that that's true i mean there's a reason for that because you want to have disciplinary standards and you don't want just some rando out there like who got through a really crappy peer review who's just makes the rest of us look like yahoos, right? So all this to say, things might challenge us because they're new ideas, but that doesn't mean that they haven't gone through peer review, all right? So that's my spiel. I've gone through everything, but you can just sort of like definitely focus on those first two parts or the really key things that I want you to look at these first two sections. And then, you know, start reading. We're going to be, you're going to learn about this sort of active reading exercise that we're going to be doing together. So yeah, that's it.